Forgive them, for they know not what they do. So said Nicholas II, Tsar of all the Russias, the night he and his family were brutally executed by a Bolshevik death squad in Ekaterinburg. It had been a long time coming as Russia was quickly falling apart in the midst of World War I and its own civil wars. The Tsar and Tsarina, Alexandra, were not always popular among their people. Nicholas favored policies with strong nationalism, limited or no rights for minorities, and restrictions on any outside religion. 80% of Russia was in poverty. Thousands were unemployed, and those who were lucky enough to have jobs were subjected to over 11-hour workdays, dangerous working conditions, abusive bosses, and low wages. The war created nationwide food shortages and deprivation, making it even more difficult for peasants to scrape by. The military drafted millions and suffered countless defeats due to their poor leadership and lack of supplies. Two-thirds of the men sent to the front lines went with no weapons. They were told simply to find one among the dead, and that was all they had. The calls for an overthrow of the 300-year-old monarchy became too great. Nicholas abdicated his throne on March 2, 1917, and left Russia in the hands of a provisional government. The communist regime drew the attention of the disgruntled peoples of Russia, who didn't know where else to turn. The Bolsheviks, as they came to be called, were led by a nam man named Lenin. Lenin was able to keep his men organized and recruit the deserters from the crushed Russian army and successfully overthrew the provisional government. The Soviet Union was established at the expense of thousands and would never be contested by the Tsar and his heir, who, on the night of July 16th to the 17th of 1918, had been executed and seemingly lost forever. It was July 16th, 1918. The Tsar and his family had only been reunited for two months in Ekaterinburg. They included Tsar Nicholas, Tsarina Alexandra, Tsarevich Alexei, Grand Duchess Olga, Grand Duchess Tatiana, Grand Duchess Marie, Grand Duchess Anastasia, their doctor, Sergei Botkin, their cook, Karatinov, the Tsar's footman, Trupp, and the Tsarina's maid, Anna Demidova. The family was no longer royalty. They were prisoners in their own country. At 10.30 that fateful night, the family retired to bed, only to be woken up again at midnight. They were told to gather a few things. They were being taken to jail. The men herded the family into a small basement room where they lined them up under the pretense of taking a photo. It was at this time that a Fiat truck roared to life outside the door, drowning out all sound. Jacob Yurovsky, commander of this task, began to read a death creed to the family. The family, out of shock, or simply because they could not hear, asked that it be read again. And as Yurovsky began a second reading, shocks resounded in the room. Tsar Nicholas II, last of the Romanovs, fell dead instantly. Twelve men poured bullets into the room. Yurovsky, Ermakov, Grigory Nikulin, Alexei Kavanov, Pavel Mativedev, Mikhail Mativedev Kudrin, and six Lativian guards. They fired until their clips were emptied. At the end of the onslaught, six were still alive. Alexei, Three of his sisters, Anna, Demidova, and Dr. Botkin. Out of ammo and amazed anyone had survived, the men rushed forward to finish them off with bayonets. Yurovsky himself stepped up to the Sarvich, drew his pistol, and fired two revolver shots into the 14-year-old boy's head. The other men found that bayonets were just as ineffective as bullets as they slid across the girls' sides without puncturing. It was only later discovered that the women all had diamonds and semi-precious jewels sewn into their corsets, serving as bulletproof vests which only made their death more prolonged. When the bodies were later stripped, 18 pounds of diamonds were recovered. The bodies were loaded into the back of a truck and taken to Four Brothers Mine, 12 miles outside of town. There they were stripped, their clothes were burned, and the bodies tossed down an 8-foot mine shaft followed by several hand grenades to disfigure them. The next day it was discovered that the secret burial site was in fact well known, 
forcing Yurovsky to find some other place to hide the royal family. Two nights later, the now hideous, bloated, and fly-blown remains were loaded into a truck. Their intended destination is unknown. Along the way, the truck got stuck in a bog. At this point, two of the bodies, one male and one female, were removed from the truck and burned to ash. For whatever reason, the remaining bodies were not burned, and it was ordered that a ditch be dug six feet deep and eight feet square. Just before the bodies were buried, they were doused with sulfuric acid to mask the smell. Yurovsky was convinced they would never be found. In 1989, the bodies were officially pronounced as having been discovered. In a bog outside of Ekaterinburg, nine bodies were found with 14 bullets, bits of rope, and the shattered remains of the jar that had once encased sulfuric acid. The Russian analysis of the bones was not as competent as was needed considering the situation, so a select group of Americans were brought in to do what they do best. The group of experts included Dr. Lowell Levine, Dr. Michael Baden, Catherine Oakes, Margaret Maples, Dr. William Maples, William Goza, Dr. William Hamilton, and Dr. Alexander Melamud. The faces of the nine skeletons discovered were all horribly fractured, making any digital reconstruction risky and unreliable. A minute analysis of the nine bodies was conducted by the experts in order to make conclusive identifications. Body number one, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was identified as a full-grown female by looking at the pelvic bone. Her teeth reveal very basic dental work, however, it was the ankles of this particular skeleton that revealed the most. This woman had spent a considerable amount of time crouching and kneeling. This led the experts to believe that this, this particular skeleton could only be Anna Demidova. Body number two, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was characterized by a flat, sloping forehead and its lack of any upper teeth. The White Army, while investigating the disappearance of the family, had discovered a upper denture plate at the Four Brothers' mine. These two characteristics were able to identify the man as Dr. Sergei Botkin. He was killed by a bullet that entered through the upper left forehead and exited through the right temporal area. Body number three, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was a full-grown female estimated to be around 64.9 inches tall. Her facial bones were missing, however, she did have extensive dental work and a very characteristic bulging forehead. By comparing photographs to this particular skeleton, they identified it as Grand Duchess Olga, the oldest of the children. Olga had been killed by a gunshot that entered through her jaw, broke it, went through her palate, and out the top of her head. Body number five, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was a woman in her late teens or early twenties. The facial bones of the skeleton were also missing. She was estimated to be around 67.5 inches tall and was the youngest skeleton found. They knew this based off of incomplete molar root tips, a sacrum that had not reached maturity, and evidence that growth had just ended in the limbs. The cause of death for this body was not evident in the bones. Body number six, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was a full-grown female, estimated to be around 65.6 inches tall. Her pelvic rim, sacrum, and collarbone were all mature, meaning the victim was at least 20 years old at the time of death. Her growth and dental work fit nicely between the those of bodies three and five, meaning that this victim could only be Tatiana. Tatiana was 21 at the time of the shooting. Her death was caused by a gunshot that entered through the back left side of her skull and exited by her right temple. Body number eight, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was a skeleton in fragments. Of the nine unearthed, it was the most badly damaged by acid, initially leading the experts to believe that it was that of the Tsar. Other characteristics, such as the fact that the skeleton had no teeth and a flattened profile, contradicted this theory. It was an adult male in its 40s to 50s. But it was not the star. It could only be 
the cook, Ivan Mikhailovich Karatinov. The experts concluded that the reason this particular skeleton was so badly damaged by acid was because it had been placed at the very bottom of the pit. Body number nine, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was a large boned male over six feet tall. The back of his skull was missing and he had a bayonet stab through his breastbone. The description of this skeleton matched closely with descriptions of the footman, Alexei Igorovich Trupp. Body number seven, as examined by Dr. William Maples, was an older female whose exquisite dental work initially led the explorers to believe they had found the missing Romanov family. The skull had exquisite shining platinum crowns, porcelain crowns, and multiple gold fillings, leading the experts to believe that this could only be the Tsarina Alexandra. The Tsarina's breastbone depicted a multitude of damage most likely received from bayonet. Body number four is examined by Dr. William Maples was a short, middle-aged man with a broad skull and a flat palate. These characteristics matched photographs of the Tsar. The hip bones of this skeleton were worn and deformed from extensive horseback riding, something that is well known as a pastime of the Tsar. The facial features of this skull were brutally shattered, further reassuring the experts that they had found the body of Tsar Nicholas II. The only inconsistent trait was the skull's teeth, which were decayed and in horrible repair. The experts questioned why the most powerful man would not care for his own teeth. Two of the eleven victims were not in the pit. None of the bodies found could have been those of Alexei and Anastasia. In the Bolshevik account of the executions, they reportedly removed the Tsarina's and her son from the truck and burned them to ash. However, the Tsarina's body was recovered from the pit. So where were Alexei and Anastasia? How could the Bolsheviks mistake a 17-year-old girl for her mother? Dr. William Maples believed it would be very easy. By the time the bodies ended up in the bog, they had been decaying for three days in 70-degree weather. The hair of the women would have been black and hardened with blood. They would have been bloated and covered in a thick, foamy froth from the flies and maggots who had made themselves at home among the wounds and openings of the Romanov family. This confusion has given one last straw to grasp at to the resurrectionists who believe Anastasia escaped the execution that engulfed her family. It is as Dr. Maple said in his book, Is it even remotely possible that Anastasia and Alexei survived? Is it conceivable that some kind-hearted Bolshevik spirited them away? Is it thinkable that, despite their wounds, wounds that would have been doubly injurious to a hemophiliac like Alexei, the missing royal children lived, recovered their health, and escaped to the West? Of course it is. I merely say it is highly unlikely. My experience with murder, ancient and modern, makes it hard for me to believe in these far-fetched mercies. And so ended the Romanovs, the ruling family of Russia. Herded into a crowded room, shot down and bludgeoned to death like animals, and buried in a pile in an unmarked grave. The biggest mystery of the 20th century has seemingly been solved.